Why is our Citation X11 such a hero with performance-minded Americans? Let's ask single person. Back in 1980, General Motors introduced its first front-wheel drive compact car platform, the redesigned X-Body, with Chevrolet leading the way with its all-new Citation. Along with similar models from Pontiac, Oldsmobile, and Buick, the X-Body was initially a huge success and winning Motor Trends Car of the Year. But all the hype was quickly diminished when the public learned the Citation was prone to rust, catch fire, and unable to safely stop in heavy braking. It got so bad that GM was even sued by the NHTSA, resulting in the Citation to be among the most recalled vehicles ever made. This is the story of the rise and fall of the Chevy Citation, along with the entire X-Body line. This is my old car. More amazing, it carries five adults comfortably. Then your Citation X11 will fit right in when you're married and have kids. I'm going to pretend you never said that. Chevy makes good things happen. So although I have gotten many requests to do an episode on the Citation, it's a new Chevy kind of I'm sure others will remind me that a lot of videos have already been done on this car. As those of you who follow me on Instagram or on my YouTube community page already know, I've had to cut back on how often I release these videos due to new employment I have. So going forward, I will likely do episodes on cars which not just get a lot of requests, but are also cars that meant something to me as I was growing up. The Citation is definitely in the latter category, and I didn't realize what a complete failure and embarrassment it was for GM until many years later. My dad worked for GM back then, and so we always had GM cars in our garage, usually replaced every couple of years. At least two of those cars were Citations, and my dad often brought home color brochures that would tout how revolutionary and amazing each new GM model was, and the new X-Body platform was no exception. Although I don't remember for sure, I think the second Citation immediately replaced the first, and I never remember him saying anything bad about them. My dad was very loyal to the company back then, or at least it seemed so to me, so if he did have complaints, I never heard it. But I do remember thinking the name Citation was an odd choice. Chevy Citation. Its owners might say... It's the model of versatility. As I thought a Citation was another name for a ticket that you got when a cop pulled you over. Hey! Put it over! Oh, me? Yeah! Oh, 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 oh. Which it is. But the word Citation is also synonymous with award or honor, which is presumably what GM had in mind. Because of all the bad press that the front-wheel drive X-Body brought to GM by its end in 1985, some may not realize that GM used the same letter for a rear-wheel drive platform that began in 1961. That platform was the basis for the Chevy 2, which later became the Nova, the Buick Apollo, which later became the Skylark, the Pontiac Ventura, which later became the Phoenix, and the Oldsmobile Omega. During the mid-70s, thanks to the unexpected success of front-wheel drive imports like the Honda Accord and Volkswagen Rabbit, GM started planning for the replacement of the X-Body to be a front-wheel drive transverse engine design. Although GM was not new to front-wheel drive, up to that point it was only in some of their larger cars, so putting it in a compact was a big deal for them at the time. In fact, GM even reverse-engineered front-wheel drive Lancias to help them learn about how to make front-wheel drive work in a small car. And they had to get it done quickly, as the front-wheel drive Toyota Tercel, Tercel. Toyota. and the new Chrysler subcompacts, the Dodge Omni and Plymouth Horizon, were debuting for 1978. Well, in fact, 1978 had been the original plan for the debut of the new X-Body cars, and at that time, GM planned to retire the Nova name and have the new X-Body Chevy be called the Condor. To me, that name really didn't fit a compact car, considering the California Condor is the largest flying bird in North America. But getting GM suppliers on board for large-scale production of the new front-wheel drive X-Body delayed the rollout, so in the interim, Maybe the execs at GM also realized Condor wasn't a good name, and renamed it to the Citation, launching in April of 1979 as a 1980 model. The new Citation replaces the venerable Chevy Nova. Almost two feet shorter and 800 pounds lighter, Citation styling is sporty. <laughs> With four different models sharing the X-Body line, it was also one of the first examples where GM attempted to divide up the responsibility of the development across all four divisions, <laughs> hoping that could speed up the pace. The mandates that GM put on their divisions to pull this off. Omega, the Oldsmobile of small cars. Paired with the difficulty the four divisions had working with one another, has been widely agreed upon many automotive historians as the key reasons why the X-Body cars, led by the Chevy Citation, were doomed before they hit showrooms. To help bring good publicity to the car, GM was happy to provide sample cars to the press prior to the public launch. This could be the car you had in mind. But what wasn't discovered until regular production began was that the press cars were hand-built pre-production models. The trick worked, with the automotive press giving rave reviews. 
From the start, GM offered the Citation with two engine choices, a 2.5 liter four-cylinder that carried over from the previous X-Body, known as the Iron Duke, and a 2.8 liter V6 that was designed new for the front drive X-Body. Why is our front wheel drive Chevy Citation such a hero with so many Americans? Let's ask working woman. But GM didn't predict another gasoline shortage during the Citation's launch and instead assumed 70% of the buyers would want the V6. But is there no room in your life for play? I'm working on it. The actual numbers were just the opposite, resulting in many customers waiting for months to get their four-cylinder model as GM tried to ramp up production to meet demand. The Citation was offered in three body styles, a two- or four-door hatchback and a two-door coupe. The four-door hatchback was by far the favorite of buyers, representing about half of the first year sales. The two-door coupe was the least popular, so Chevy dropped it for 1981, but then decided to bring the coupe back for 1982. Initial sales were also boosted by a sportier option called the X11, which you couldn't miss thanks to the big X11 decals on the sides. The X11 also had a different steering wheel and more engine gauges on its dashboard, and a functional hood scoop was added in 1981. Inside, the Citation dashboard deviated from the norm with its vertically positioned radio. Having it be vertical instead of a traditional horizontal probably was done just to be different. But then again, maybe GM didn't want anyone putting aftermarket car stereos in the Citation, so the vertical placement helped ensure your Citation would always have the factory original radio. Citation, excitation, yeah. The Citation also showed a new styling direction for GM, thanks to its two-tone paint scheme, with different colors above and below the center door molding. Considering that I didn't grow up in the 50s, when two-tone paint, not to mention in-your-face style, was quite common, I was first introduced to the blandest era of car design, the 1980s. So the Citation's two-tone paint scheme, in my opinion, really helped inject a bit of style in a car that otherwise sorely lacked any, and it probably helped sales, at least initially. Over at Pontiac, the Phoenix name from the previous X-Body carried over, as did the Oldsmobile Omega and the Buick Skylark. The Phoenix didn't offer the two-door hatchback as the Citation did, but later it did offer an SJ trim that mimicked the Citation X11. The Oldsmobile and Buick models only shared a two-door body style with the Citation, and never had a hatchback model instead offering a four-door sedan that the Citation never had. Despite winning Motor Trend's Car of the Year Award for 1980, an honor that today they prefer not to bring up, many of the 811,000 owners of 1980 Citations soon realized that the 6,000 US dollars they spent on their new cars didn't mean they got a quality car. Many Citations, even before they reached their second year, started to show signs of rust. Interior trim and other connectors would fall off. Transmission hoses would tend to fail and start fires and the Iron Duke often rattled and shook. And check out this crash test footage. Had this been publicly known before the car's release, I doubt it would have sold nearly as well in its first year. And if those issues weren't bad enough, the most common complaint was the brakes. Every X-Body car, not just the Citation, would often lock up its rear wheels upon heavy braking, causing the rear end to slide out of control, with hundreds of complaints pouring in, especially for the faulty brakes. The National Highway and Traffic Safety Administration, or NHTSA, pressured GM to issue a recall. Although GM did some recalls, less than 48,000 of the million cars sold up at that point were actually recalled, as GM avoided any public announcements. Instead, the recalls were entirely voluntary, and the fixes did little to solve the issue, as cars which had supposedly been repaired behaved the same way under hard braking. By 1983, with complaints still mounting, GM initiated a second recall of 240,000 models from the 1980 model year. But since this was still only a fraction of the 1980 models sold across all four divisions, and the recall was still only voluntary, presumably because GM refused to take it seriously, the NHTSA worked with the United States Justice Department to file a lawsuit against General Motors to recall every 1980 X-Body model. The lawsuit would drag on until 1987, and by then GM actually succeeded in getting the lawsuit dismissed, but that was long after the damage was done. By 1983, sales of the Citation dropped to under 93,000, which was only about 10% of the sales they had just two years earlier. So GM decided, however short-sightedly, to try changing the name of the car for the 1984 model year to Citation 2. Yes, as in Citation, the sequel. Why the hell aren't I notified about these things? It wasn't without precedent, as Ford stuck a 2 on the end of some of their models in the 70s. But for them, it was because enough changes were made to the car to warrant the 2 added on the end. For the Citation, the 2 was just a gimmick as little was changed or improved from the 1983 model year, despite what the ad said. Since that time, they've improved its performance, improved its ride, improved its comfort. But for a few unsuspecting buyers, the scam worked, 
as sales did increase by about 5,000 units for 1984. By 1985, its final year of production, GM finally caved to the complaints of owners wanting to replace their car stereo and redesigned the dashboard to include a traditional horizontally aligned radio. But overall sales continued to drop, and GM finally chose to end the X-Body production that year. Pontiac and Oldsmobile also chose not to continue using the Phoenix or Omega names in future models. However, Buick continued the Skylark for its fifth generation in 1986 as the N-Body. Competition from some of Chevrolet's other models may have also played a role in the decreased Citation sales, such as the smaller J-Body Cavalier, which launched in 1981, and the larger A-Body Celebrity, based on a stretched version of the X-Body, which launched in 1982. The Citation would later officially be replaced in the Chevy lineup by the two-door Beretta and four-door Corsica, and although those cars had their own faults, compared to the Citation, they were a huge improvement. By the end of the 1980s, Citations were already becoming less common on the roads, although I couldn't help notice that a Citation was in Tim Burton's Batman movie from 1989, considering the quality of all the cars in the movie, with the exception of the Batmobile, of course. The Citation seemed to fit right in. Thanks to their propensity to rust, seeing one today is a rare sight. So if you own one, you own a genuine piece of automotive history. A piece that General Motors would very much like you to pretend never happened. Thanks for watching. If you liked this video, click the like button and subscribe to my channel. If you once owned a car from the 80s to mid 2000s that you rarely see today and would like it featured in a future episode, leave a reply in the comments or contact me at the email shown here. See you next time. Yeah.